Good morning, everyone. This is the September 9th Friday meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. And seeing we have a quorum, I am going to uh, call out people's names as I see them on the screen, because we're conducting this meeting virtually by Zoom, and I need to make sure all committee members can hear and be heard. Uh, Mike? Here. Uh, Paul? Present. Sean? Here. Jonathan? Good morning. Phoebe? Hello. Hi. Ben? I'm here. And Simone? Here. Okay, as others join, um, if I don't see them, just call them out to me and I'll make sure we recognize them. And I see we did bring uh, Vivian has joined us. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Margaret um, for to show the agenda. And I want to just say we have one additional item. I just sent it um, to everyone late breaking this morning um, on a question on would we consider changing the meeting time for the committee? Alicia Walker sent us a letter that I have posted that she's taken a job that makes the morning meeting impossible for her. So under the 48 hour rule, we'll get to that at the end of the agenda, but just a discussion uh, of, of whether that can be accommodated because we need to make sure we can keep a quorum and we can keep people together because we had originally told everyone it would be a morning meeting. So I reposted the charge and I posted her letter. So Margaret, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. Can everybody see that? Uh, yeah. I, I can, so I shouldn't okay. answer everybody. I'm guessing everybody can. Okay. So um, the... There aren't a lot of items, but I think there will be a lot to look at. Um, the big one is that Janiska is going to give us updates on the building site plans, the building plans, as well as the building exterior. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of recap on the daylighting discussion in the net zero committee, and then there are invoices and the issue that Kathy just brought up. So. That and, it. and Margaret, just looking at the agenda, we talked about on the building exterior setting up a subcommittee. So that's one of the items for today on seeing who would be interested. In, and it would be a short term uh, bringing options back, not making decisions. Right. Recommend, you know, recommendations and options. So, OK. Yep. I am going to turn it over to the Denisco team. I think Tim, Tim is going to present. Let me just make sure, I see Rupert has joined us. So Rupert, um, I just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And um, as Margaret uh, mentioned, we're going to do some updates on site plan and plan. And then move into the exterior of the building. Um, All right, Tim, is there a way to uh, maybe just view it full screen or something? We're just getting more. What do you have? I, we're just seeing the P, the whole PDF, it just because these are all graphics. I don't know How if about, you can no. view full screen. No, we're just moving the page. He, he might be able to make a little bigger, but I don't I'll know. just make it bigger. Command plus. Or or command L will maybe bring it full screen, but then you can't zoom easily. Uh, this is in the command L view. Um, you can you, do you st it's still right. see the border? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, Tim, can you ad advance? I'm wondering if you're sharing the right, the, the correct. No, I guess you are. Can you? Yeah. I can zoom in more if that helps. Uh, the unfortunate thing is I'm working with one screen, so I can't exactly see what you are seeing. Uh, but this is Command L, and this is um, okay. not okay. used. I zoom out a little bit more, though, Tim, just for context as you talked about the site plan. Just okay. You had it. 
So the site plan, uh, we want to talk about actually things that are going on in the background. One, we had a productive meeting with uh, Ray Harp uh, and Dave Zomek to talk about uh, accommodating non-school uses on site, specifically the rec department, um, understanding what they use in terms of softball and other fields on site and how we can organize our playing fields, um, the athletic fields that we will be built as part of the project uh, so that, um, you know, this is a, a fully developed town asset uh, with the school coming first, but uh, everyone else uh, to the point possible um, being accommodated. And then we've restated what we have been stating all along. The fields will be replaced in kind. Uh, we may change the orientation of the softball field as it's shown here, uh, rotated so it works a little bit better with the playgrounds. Um, but as we've been saying, the are and you, we can't see. Yeah, we can't see the. Can you can you zoom out a little bit more? Because I don't think I can't see the whole site. So if you do the minus, yes, is that we don't see the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> you got to just zoom out. Just see the minus sign, the minus button. There you go. Um, so the softball field might be, uh, turned, which we will study a little bit. Um, and then as we've been saying all along, the, uh, existing lights that are there that are somewhat outdated and the, um, exterior restrooms will not be replaced as part of the school project. Um, but we do expect to get a full schedule from Ray Harp. And once we, uh, get that, we can, uh, really get into it and make sure that we're accommodating enough fields. Uh, there's also been some testing that's been going on on site. Uh, the surveyors have remarked the wetlands and our specialist Amy Ball was out there. Um, we don't have a report from her yet, but she's in the process of talking to Erin Jacques. And the wetlands, as she observed when she was out the week of the 29th, are almost entirely in line with uh, the delineation from 2019. So that is um, good for our understanding of what we can do. And it's also um, good so that we can move the process along. Uh, also, during the week of the 29th, um, there were geotechnical borings uh, conducted on site within the footprint of the building uh, to get the soil profile. Again, we don't have the report on that, but the initial um, discussion that we've had with the geotechnical engineer is that the findings were in line with what they expected from previous explorations and the soil modifications and foundation systems that we carried in the PDP estimates are, are probably accurate for what the eventual soil conditions will be. Um, this is a riverbed and uh, historically a lake bed. So as we thought, uh, there is a lot of clay in the soil, which is compressible and soft. So there will be some soil modifications uh, for MDAG record peers. Um, required. So this is not a surprise. Um, but it is a confirmation that we are uh, moving on the right path. Um, we also heard, uh, actually, got a call yesterday that the um, geothermal test well is available, or the contractor that will be drilling the well will be available the week of September 19th. Uh, so we're in the process of coordinating, setting that up. But there will be a location south of the existing building and south of the new building, probably, that will uh, Give us the first step in determining the efficiency of those wells so we can eventually do the mechanical design. Uh, Kathy, you have your. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I just wanted to make sure um, Viv, I, I, that I saw Tammy and Angelica have joined us. So I just want to make sure they can both hear and be heard. So, Tammy and Angelica, Tammy. Yeah, thank you. And Angelica. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I had a couple questions, Tim, one on wetlands. Um, part of the plan was to move and replace wetlands. Do we need, and my question is timing and process, do we need Conservation Commission to have signed off on those before we uh, go to the MSBA to get, here's our final cost, or is that a process that happens after? Um, so that's my question on on the steps that we have to take so the the full detail of where 
so there are multiple steps. There's the initial, the ANRAD, which is the definition of the wetlands, and that will happen before we go to the MSBA. The full site development package and uh, that will eventually get signed off on by CONCOM and we will receive our order of conditions. That will be after. Okay. Um, but the amount of wetlands that we are at this point intending to reconstruct, move, affect in any way are are very small. It's actually a wetland finger between the existing softball field and the fields to the west of it at the stuff. Okay. Now my other question is September 19th. If people wanted to go and see the drilling, can you um once it's set up, can you give us a time like UMass did this and some people went and kind of observed. I, you know, and I don't know whether that's possible or not. Uh, we that we might want to defer that to Mike and okay. Tammy. Okay, so it, it was uh, just only, only because right is September nineteenth. It's a school day. I think. Okay. Is it Tim? It's a uh, well. What day? It, it is a school day. Um. So I was about to get into the process of what the geotech, uh, what the geothermal test will, will involve. It will be similar in terms of equipment and noise to the drilling that was there the week of. August 29th, I believe, um, uh, only slightly different that there's only going to be one well, they will drill that and which will probably take one day, and then they will leave a a water tank, essentially, and, uh, and a little pump and, and a generator that will pump water through the test well uh, to test the thermal conductivity of it. So day two and three actually will not be that interesting unless you want to go and, and look okay. at a box next to a well on site and and then day one will be similar to what was already there so i mean it is interesting in terms of the overall you know what the building is going to be and how it's going to function but uh, mechanically i i don't know how interesting it is and i also don't know that you want to invite people on the site uh, okay. so i see mike thank you yeah so just on that i mean when when we have kids in the building, we try to not have lots of visitors on site just for safety and security reasons. So, you know, if the people will still be working after three o'clock, that gets a lot easier. I mean, we have our after school program there, but just we don't have a, a school full of kids. So, you know, I don't know what the schedule is, but if people did want to come, that would be a time where we'd be much more comfortable with people coming on site uh, during the school day, which is roughly eight to 2.45. Um, that's where we wouldn't want people and we really don't want more people during dismissal. Um, I think Tammy would attest to that. Um, uh, so, you know, if it's after three o'clock and, and, you know, people want to go check it out, that's, you know, that's where our school kind of property opens up for people to visit and you know it sounds like it's a full day affair or multi-day affair and you know that that's really doesn't sound super interesting to you but to me but I'm one person and uh other people what I don't find interesting other people may find enlightening so you know we're open to that so thank thank you you know yeah, it, it, yeah. sorry just and we're really digressing here Mike um our staff or our team members oh. won't be in the building but they'll be on site do they need to get quarried Nope. Uh, no, we'll have, we, we don't have unsupervised folks, but, you know, in terms of visitors who don't have an uh, official role to be on site, um, that's where we, we try to limit number of people. They're there to do a job. That's not a problem. They're outside. Okay. That's not a problem. Perfect. Um, okay. But if Just they were coming in the building, that. I'd give you a different answer. Um, okay. And uh, it, the visitors part is the part that we, we get very cautious about. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then one more thing on the site, uh, we're just in the process of uh, setting up a few meetings to review traffic um, on site circulation uh, with Guilford, the school staff, so we can finalize um, pick up drop off routines, site circulation, um, where additional parking uh, for vans uh, and specialty uses and uh, service should be. Um, so the site plan in general has not changed in the past week, but there are a lot of things on tap that potentially will have effect on it. Moving into the building, um, we have also only made minor revisions. Uh, Phoebe, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Can you go back to the site plan? Um, I know it hasn't changed much, but I did have a couple mm -hmm. of questions. Um, one of which is I'm trying to figure out and I can't, um, 
I can't visualize it based on looking at this, obviously, and looking at the actual site of Fort River, but like, how does this compare to the amount of green space we have right now that's usable for fields and play and all of that kind of stuff? Um, and I, what I don't see, I don't see any blacktop space, that kind of stuff. So I understand that that you guys are in the process of talking to people to figure out what you know, the basic needs are not only of the school, but of the town with, with regards to use of this. Um, but I'm wondering if we have a general idea of how it's going to compare um, to what we have available right now. Um, well, I, I can I can give you some uh, answer to that. I can tell you that the building footprint is about 49,000 square feet compared to 82,000 square feet for the existing building. So there is less building on site um, in terms of an actual square footage takeoff of this area, which is the hardscape place so where you would have half court and some full court basketball, four square, that sort of thing. It's similar, maybe a bit larger than what exists at uh, the northern end of the building now. And then there, these areas marked play um, are um, playgrounds that'll have a a drainable rubber surface uh, for safety. And then we do not have them developed. Could you try again? We don't have them developed, but we'll be talking about uh, the outdoor learning spaces. Uh, so we don't know exactly how large they are, but they will be distributed through the site. And then the intent of the athletic fields is to essentially replace them in kind. Um, the softball field is the same size as the one that is at the southern end of the site currently. Um, this area is about the size of the multipurpose um, field area to the east of the existing site. Um, and this is another ultimate Frisbee size site. Um, you know, as we fully develop all of these fields with input from Ray and the school, we can give numbers and that, but in total, there is a smaller building, a similar amount of hardscape play area. There is increased outdoor learning opportunities and structured outdoor classrooms as we develop that. And the goal is to have a similar amount of athletic fields. Um, I can't put numbers on anything besides the building footprint at the moment, but that is the intent in the direction we're moving. Still on it. Okay, thank you. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, so I think it came in a public comment to us that we were sent. I can't remember who sent it, um, but there was a, and I am not, um, I am not well-versed. Let me put this out there in the finances of all of this in terms of, you know, funding of it uh, really. But um, I wanted to ask about the CPA funding because I know that had been mentioned and something about it having to be applied for by September 30th. Are we in the process of that? Did we, I spoke, <laughs> we spoke about that yesterday with Kathy, and, and so the information that would you the town would need to apply for that we can provide. Sean, Sean has his hand up, and I, and I'll talk to this too. Yeah, the CPA window is open right now um, until the thirtieth. Um, CPA committee evaluates lots of proposals every year, so. Um, this proposal could certainly be submitted if we have sufficient information. Um, it is an annual process as well. So it's it's this year, but it'll, it's every year. Um, but you know, in terms of needing some information, possibly in advance of a debt exclusion vote, I can see why maybe this would be a cycle that we'd wanna, um, that an application might wanna be submitted. And so what I asked um, Phoebe on a sort of, where Sean just said, we, we need from Denisco, a number, a dollar number, that is the community field that isn't the school, you know, so that it's a, a separate piece from the school. And so they they said they'd be able to give that to us, you know, so then we can talk about the drainage that's being added, you know, the way the fields are being improved and then replaced. That would be need to be part of the proposal because CPA has recreation in it. It doesn't have the word school in it. <laughs> So it has to be the community field part of it. So we need we need that dollar number, you know, with a, a 
you know, rough justification of, of this is how we came up. It's similar to the way the Jones Library had a piece mm -hmm. of the library that was the uh, historic special collections. They identified that as a sub piece. Um, so we would need to do that with this project. Okay, and then who's responsible for actually like doing the application um, when we have that information? So it could be it could be town staff, it could be community members, um, anyone can submit a CPA application. The application's live on the, the website now. Okay, thank you. Um, should we move on to the building plans? Um, moving into the building on the first floor, there have been incremental changes and we had some very productive meetings yesterday with the administration, uh, the administrative staff and the music staff, um, also the gym and food service um, that will lead to some changes upcoming uh, in how the administration suite is laid out uh, and how we can best accommodate all of the multiple uses of the robust music uh, program that uh, you were lucky to have in your district. Um, and so that will allow us to con you know, continue to massage these spaces uh, to um, make them more efficient. Um, moving up through the building, we, there have been some incremental pushes and pulls, um, listening to uh, the comments that we've had about um, simplifying the exterior, making sure the uh, program is within an efficient envelope, and making sure that all of the adjacencies are working for the staff and the district, as we've discussed. Um, there are still um, some spaces that are not programmed yet. Uh, well, I, I should say that there are large inefficient circulation spaces and that we are working on filling with um, the spaces that we need to make the building work as we work with our consultants, like emergency electrical rooms and stuff like that. Uh, but these spaces will be developed as we move forward. Um, and so with that update on the site, and the plans of the building, we're going to start to discuss uh, the exterior of the building. So here is a very early massing concept um, of the building as it's laid out now, how it is planned. Um, this is looking slightly from the northwest with this being the main entrance. Uh, this volume is the administration suite and the lobby. This volume is the music room. This volume is the stack of the cafeteria on the first floor and the library on the second floor. And beyond is the gym. And then as we get all of the beyond all the public spaces from the entrance, there is the three story um, portion of the L portion of the building with the academic classrooms and everything else. Um, what this shows, is since there is no second floor over the administration suite in the music, we can tilt the roof to allow north light in to illuminate the lobby um, to get lots of daylight into the music library and cafeteria. And then a more regular expression where we have the classrooms. Uh, this is one of many options we're looking at. And but, um, you know, this is one of the things we're excited about and want to you know, start to talk to a working group about design with. And we haven't really made any material choices in this drawing, only to highlight a couple areas near the entrance, possibly the entrance of the cafeteria, where we think there's an opportunity to do something particularly special. Uh, maybe it's some sort of inclusion of art. Maybe it's something really colorful that speaks to the identity of the building or however we want to do it. Maybe it's science. Um, you know, the, the, this is the very beginning of these sort of discussions we want to have. Tim, can I, can I just, um, can you talk about the stack that's sticking up in the back? Because I don't think anyone's ever seen that before. Absolutely. Um, so this is a representation of a stair to the roof. Um, it might be a, a bit larger than it needs to be. And this drawing also doesn't show all of the various things that are going to be on the roof, including equipment and PV panels. Um, but, you know, one of the many things that we have to study as part of the, the massing design is 
where this stair comes to the roof. So this is just shown in the middle of the building, which might be the most convenient. It's the stair closest to the mechanical space on the first floor in the custodian's office. So it might be the shortest path for anyone who's working on the roof to get there. It's all that this stair could, the stair to the roof could also be one that's closer to the entrance and it could be used architecturally um, as some sort of visual symbol as you approach the site. So, you know, th these are one of the many things that we will be looking at. Uh, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah. Are you looking for comments now or do you want to run through your slides and then have comments at the end? I'm afraid if I, my comments, I think everybody will have some thoughts. So maybe it's better to go through your slides. Uh, well, we're going to move off of massing onto elevations on the next slide. So I don't know if uh, you need this as a reference. Maybe I, 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 we want this to be a conversation. We Okay. I'll make three quick comments then. Mm -hmm. If you're open to that. Um, I am open to it. One is I worry about, I always worry about seams between different elevations. I've seen that in other built public buildings, like where you have the first floor roof, you know, slanted down to that seam. I'm sure you'll think about that, but even in the best constructed buildings, that that's a always a, a worry point for me. Second is um, the entrance. It feels like the entrance, the sort of glory, our glory entrance there that we want to, to is, is sort of when you enter the space, from the driveway you're coming from the south and so that that entry is i would think that you we would want that entrance to be seen pretty pretty well like really stick out mm -hmm. um and third um was and this is just sort of a basic question why don't we use pitched roofs for buildings i mean it seems like in new england we always use pitched roofs it makes sense but on you know a lot of public and institutional buildings we use flat roofs and they always seem to be problematic um that that is an interesting mix of design and, and technical questions um uh, which we could spend uh a long time talking yeah, about um, i'm not i'm not looking for answers now but just those are my questions okay um well i think all, we could address the, the roof issue tim i i think we can address the roof issue one is the size of the building and uh to create a slope roof over a well we do have some slopes here, but uh, a typical gable roof over, uh, say, the classroom story, the classroom portion of the building is a, a, an unoccupied space that has to be built, maintained, and um, it, it's simply not the most efficient way to do it. Uh, and also, um, if properly installed, detailed, and uh, built, a flat roof is just as watertight as a sloped roof. Sean? You know, just building on Paul's comments, I know from my time at the school, the facility staff at least a couple of times a year go up on the roof with shovels and have to, mm -hmm. you know, shovel the slush off the roof. And that's that's where they get a lot of the leaks is not the not the snow or not the rain, but that slush that sits on the roof. Um, are there and I'm sure there's maybe new ways that, to prevent that type of thing from happening, but I'm just curious if if that's true, if there's ways to prevent that sort of slushy uh, uh, material from sitting on top of a flat roof. Well, the answer is the roof will be designed both structurally and uh, from a weather, weather tightness point of view that snow on the roof, um, unless you get into a, a really unusual historic event, uh, should not require to be shoveled off. Uh, there's a, uh, you're also in completely separate issue is, is PB, but the roof itself should be sound. Um, it will be designed for a New England winter okay. without regular maintenance, if, if that's the short answer to the question. Jonathan. Hey, uh, it, un unfortunately, the reason we have slush on our, our roofs is because the current schools are all very under insulated and uh, the, the snow tends to melt. Um, the A new building would retain the snow a lot longer um, and there should not be the, <laughs> the need for that that <laughs> shoveling of, of material away from drains or whatever it might be um, and you know I think the thing we should not lose uh, perspective of is the need for for getting a, a nice 
open area as much as we can for those PV on the roof. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call roofs flat. Uh, they, they aren't actually flat, or at least uh, contemporary roofs are not flat. They're low slope, um, but they, they do have pitch. Um, and I, I think, uh, generally speaking, they're designed in better ways or can be designed in better ways than they were, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So. Um, so I just wanted to uh, echo what I think I heard Paul say about where the where the, some of the roofs are sort of pitched into um, the building, you know, the wall of the building kind of thing. My mind immediately went to, oh, we're going to have all the water, you know, run into. Um, so I just wanted to, I'm sure you guys have brilliance around that. But I also, because I just don't know the answer, um, I'm wondering if, so we could still put PV on those ones with the with the greater slope, uh, even though they're not as flat as the other ones? Okay. Yes. Uh, the two answers is yes, we are, will not propose anything that we do not feel that is not, uh, you know, sound in terms of a waterproof design. And two, yes, PV is available. I mean, these are still, there is a slope. It is rendered as flat in the back and, and sloped in toward the entrance, but they are all, um, sufficient uh, to host PV panels. So, so just to add to that, um, Solar Design, our solar consultant, um, will, once, once we have an understanding of equipment and the overall massing, we will share this with them and they will opine on the various types of solar. There's different types of design of solar panels, but also to make sure that where our equipment is, the slope of the roof, or more importantly, um, the solar orientation of the roofs and how it's hitting um, from, from the south exposure. They'll, they'll go through it all with us and they will certainly make any recommendations if they feel there's um, an opportunity to improve the solar. So, so once we sort of have a general idea, we'll be running all of this by them. Jonathan, do you have another comment? No. Yes, sorry. Um, just to, to touch on uh, what Paul was saying, and I suspect in this view, this, this might be a little artificial. It looks like the building's quite close to the road, but I, I agree with Paul that, that the, I, I like where this is beginning to go at the entry, but um, as folks are approaching, you know, coming from the parking towards the entry, while that wall provides a nice kind of opportunity for a little bit of a billboard, you know, a little bit of signage or a piece of artwork, um, it does tend to hide the uh, the entry a little bit where I would be worried that it would be. I'm also curious what this is going to look like from the kind of the the opposite direction as you're approaching kind of at the street level, the entrance the cars coming into the yep. site. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I'm less personally less worried about the, the pitch in the roof coming up to the, to the, uh, the other wall. I'm, I'm sure there's ways to, to deal with that. Um, but it, it's going to be interesting to see how these forms kind of link together. Um, I'm curious if, if some sort of maybe canopy or something like that could, could yeah, happen that's at the where entry I was going. that would kind of mm -hmm. highlight entry. Yeah, we, we definitely need a canopy. Um, so, you know, what what you're seeing is just the basic form right now, right? So there, there are a lot of um, items that are sort of missing from, from this massing model. So yes, so, so the entrance will absolutely be accentuated, highlighted, um, celebrated. But what, what we were really trying to show is now that we start and understand the program, we know the insides are really starting to gel and work. We have the spatial relationships and adjacencies to have the school function optimally. Now, now we're just showing, okay, this is an expression of what it could look like on the outside. Kathy. Um, yeah, well, I, I must say it's exciting for me to see something that looks like <laughs> other than three slices of, uh, you know, a 
MRI or when you see a brain slices, you never see the brain. Um, <laughs> but I, so I, Tim, can you put your little arrow on exactly where, which part is the cafeteria? Is it that first? Um, so the cafeteria is on the first, I'm sorry, there's a tree obscuring, uh, but. Uh, and then what is the one right next to it? The, the one on the first, yeah, but what, what's that? That is the music room. So this is the main music room, cafeteria, and library above it. And then over okay. here is the so, administration suite. So my question on the cafeteria, and I know this is, as Donna just said, it's a beginning. Um, having just walked around Fort River yesterday, I noticed how many people are eating outside. And so it, can there be a, a fairly big opening from the cafeteria and that green space allow for <laughs> It looks like the schools purchased a whole bunch of very nice looking picnic tables that are mobile, you know, um, but sort of it open, opening up. And I know the, the Lexington School kind of did that. It was a sense of just opening up to the outside. So that was a question over by that side. And then, um, you know, knowing that that's the music room is helpful in terms of what exactly is that room. So, so that was just my main question. And I'm assuming you'll also be doing a flip, like what's the other side look like? Um, um, you know, We will be getting to that. Um, um, this, In terms of massing, this is what we'll be showing for today. And then we want to get to some studies of the actual skin and and and, and materials and fenestration. Um, but uh, you, in the upcoming weeks, you'll be seeing many, many versions of this. So, so then on the gym, the, the one we can't see the flip side to, one of the things I saw in the gym we visited, um, again, I'll just use Lexington, is the, the placement of the windows way up high. And then a few meant when we were in the gym and there were no lights on, it was really easy to see. And it's a, a big contrast with the gym I just saw at Fort River, where if the lights aren't on, there are no, there is no light. Um, so just the gym doesn't have a slanted route here. You're just showing one window, but you'll be showing us like where are the windows and the amount of light coming into the gym. Yes, yes. absolutely. And then this is north side, south side, when you do windows, to the extent you th we're going to need shades because it's going to be sunny, you know, you'll be showing us some of, you know, yes. like, okay, those are, those are questions, not uh, how would, the, how might this look? Mm -hmm. So we, you, we will be showing you all of that. Uh, Angelica. Yes, thanks. Um, I also want to make a, a plug for just wanting to see what the entrance looks like. I think, you know, there's a lot of issues with Fort River, but one thing that's very clear is that entrance and that entrance is very welcoming. It's got a lot of scripts with different languages. And so getting more details about uh, what that entrance might look like, which brings me, I think, to my second issue is color. This is very, you know, white, <laughs> like very, you know, and color is, you know, really important to, to start talking about because this is an elementary school. And so it's something that, you know, I just would love to see more. Mm -hmm. I also was uh, thinking that the where it's it's great that you clarified about the music room because I was thinking that that was the cafeteria. Um, and the reason I thought is because of so many windows and like Kathy said, so many students are eating outside. Um, you know, my own daughter is in first grade in Fort right now, and that's a big thing for them. You know, if it's raining, they eat inside. If it's not, they're, they've gotten into this culture of eating outside and that's how they get to hang out with their friends more. So I think it's really imperative to design wise. And I might be, I don't know how possible, but it would be great to figure out some tables and things so that the outside and inside is more seamless for the cafeteria. Cause it's no longer, I think in a post COVID, whatever this world is, it's no longer just a simple, the kids eat in the cafeteria. There's got to be a lot more flow for them. Yeah, understood, um, Angelica, and thank you. And we were seeing that as well yesterday and, and every, everywhere we go, right? Um, so we will be um, starting to develop the play area and activities that are going to occur outside of the cafeteria. So, you know, we want to make sure that, and we also probably need to include Ben and Rupert as far as how they're gonna maintain the space. What are the, we're hearing like this is basketball central. Like, so, so we just have to like figure out and, and prioritize all of the needs. But um, we saw all of those red picnic tables that, that weren't just used for lunch. They, they were used 
for everything. Like staff were out there. So, so we definitely want to look at how we can incorporate that, whether it's formal dining or stumps that kids can sit and eat or whatever. So, so thank you. Yeah, we absolutely understand that. Uh, Paul, you have your... Yeah, yeah, just two two more thoughts. One is one of the things I'm really sensitive to and because of a prior community sending crews of people when there's a big snow and then another big snow and, and the worry about the weight of the snow plus in this place, the situation is solar panels, having to have people go up and shovel off snow because the maintenance were so nervous about you know the, the loads on the building as, as snow is as the melt and stuff. So, you know, thinking... We, we are going to continue to get snow and probably in, in greater streams. I'm sure your engineers will think that through and you guys will think that through. The other one, I don't think this is a thing for us, but it might be um, if we're, we're losing an, uh, a restroom for our field facilities, it seems like, and whether that should be incorporated into the design of this building or some kind of standalone structure, or if there should be a restroom at all. I think we are hearing more and more demand for rest, you know, public restrooms in areas where there are events and uh, of course, this will be a premier location for um, recreation events, I think. And so I don't know if it makes sense to have an outward facing bathroom incorporated into this design or if that should be seen as a separate building. Uh, Mike? Yeah, so uh, this is probably a topic for a future meeting agenda. So I'll just yeah. respond to Paul there, which is I think I think we do when we started that conversation yesterday with Dave Zolmek from the you know assistant town manager and recreation and Ray, uh, or this week it wasn't yesterday. I apologize. Um, about what do we think about that? What is the future of that? And and you know how do we prioritize school use and recess and kid use with community use? A field that hasn't always gone smoothly, um, just bluntly. You know, I think we've had lots of adult beverage containers and things like that left after softball games. I want to publicly thank the Amherst Recreation Department. It has gotten dramatically better based on their good work. And I, I thanked Ray the other day. He emailed me about it. And I want to thank him here with more people watching um, that that's gotten better. And it's an incredible load for them to carry. Uh, and, and there's real questions about sustainability. So, so I do think there's really a conversation to be had about how do we balance the needs of the community versus the school, um, you know, what kids would use versus adults would use, uh, and who maintains that. So the bathroom is a great example of, you know, who's picking up after that if it's not used by the school and what's what's the cycle. And, and again, uh, we try to work as best we can, and there's times where it's worked well, and there's times where it's been highly problematic. So um, I think the other thing that I'm hearing about sometimes from the community is, you know, and this is a huge topic not to delve into, but I'm going to say it because it's relevant. Uh, what's going to happen on the Wildwood site, right? You know, is that going to be a really great site? You know, many communities have schools that have closed, my own home community being one of them, that turn into this prime location for community use um, so that it doesn't have the overlap with the schools and it's a little bit cleaner. I'm not proposing that. I'm just saying it's it's things I'm hearing about, you know, as safety and other concerns come up uh, more and more in schools, there's perhaps kind of the idyllic vision of, of schools and community all using same site, you know, with some overlap is, is seeming less attractive to some people in our community. So I want to be sensitive to that. I'm not at all suggesting that we shouldn't have community use of this property. I don't want to be misinterpreted in saying that. I just think the conversation has to really be about uh, what is the intended use? What is the intended use of other fields in town? And how do we balance those two? Uh, as we look at the field use, and some of this was the conversation we had, you know, what was really helpful, uh, and I suggested this to uh, Tim yesterday, and I'll say it to the group, is it'd be great if we could have an in-person meeting someday at Fort River and just walk the site. For me, it felt really different seeing where the building would be and seeing it. I'm not Jonathan. I can't just visually design, like look at a, a map and, and figure out where things would go. And it helped me have a better perspective uh, on that and whether that has to be a formal meeting of this group or it, it really shifted my thinking about it. I think everybody would benefit from something like that. So I, all I'm suggesting in this long-winded comment, I apologize, I'm pretty quiet. The rest of the meeting was uh, that I think we need to have active discussions about that. When we talk about a bathroom, you know, one of the things that, you know, what's the maintenance of that? Uh, who maintains that and who makes sure that there's not, you know, and it's no critique of people who play softball or basketball or other things. We, we love that that's, the community comes in and uses those at appropriate hours. 
And uh, if the Fort River custodian was on this call, he'd have a lot of different opinions uh, about that and how he wants to dedicate his time to kids and not maintaining community use. So um, lots to talk about. You know, I think it should be in a, a specific agenda item for a future meeting because I do think it makes sense. And I, I would love to uh, encourage folks to have the same experience I had, which is literally being on site and trying to picture where it is and looking at where the fields are. And uh, thanks, Tim, for walking me around. It was really helpful. Thank you. Um, we also want to start to talk about the fenestration, how the materials, windows, um, the elements of the building, aside from the sculptural shaping of it, the massing, uh, will be articulated moving forward. Uh, we're starting to look at classroom fenestration, which will repeat on uh, the building and, and create the basic fabric of the elevations. Um, you know, here are some studies of how we can um, create different patterns that will alternate, how we can introduce color in large or small groups, whether that color is bright and varied or, or, or subtle and specific to specific windows. Um, it, you know, these are all um, a sort of a mix on a spectrum between sort of traditional punched openings in a series to um, moving around a little bit and introducing color randomly. Um, you know, as we get into this, we will uh, present different schemes on different options and look for your feedback so we can get you the uh, building that you want. Um, there are um, yeah Tim let me can I just interrupt uh, and going responding I think it was Angelica's comment on the color of the building um, the the building is not going to be white um, I we promise you uh, but but because we haven't really started those conversations yet we didn't want to kind of infuse a color that would be an assumption that that's the direction. So, so when we did the massing study, really we wanted you to focus on the volumes. Um, and here what you're seeing is, again, we're, we're not suggesting orange. We're, we're, we're just trying to evoke conversation. We haven't picked either the material or the color of the material for the massing. And that's what these working groups will hopefully help us develop and come up with some recommendations to you. So the focus, what, why, why we kind of neutralize or mute the facade, we wanted you to focus like on this, in this instance, it's the pattern of the windows. So I hope that, I, I just want to set the tone there. I don't want you to focus on why, well, orange, are you guys crazy? So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. So, Tim, when as you go through these, my question, Donna, was not as much on color, is that if I look at some of the big window versus small window, my question is, which windows open? You know, which can I open? Um, so just as I'm not saying that, tell me which one, ones of these, but just thinking of um, uh, the amount of light that comes in, but the amount of air that you might want to have come in. Um, mm -hmm and whether you would vary that on the south side compared to the north side. It's just, these are, it's just a question, yeah. Sure. Um, I, I will say typically uh, the smaller lights in the windows are going to be the ones that are operable for various reasons. Um, one, uh, windows are heavy, uh, large, um, operable windows, if it were a, a major, major chunk of the wall, um, it, it would put a, a stress and strain on the hardware and they would be hard to open. Um, also uh, with a the smaller windows open, there would be enough to give you the area that you would need for circulation. Um, we'll also speak to the comment that the mechanical systems, unless you have perfect temperatures outside, will operate better with the windows closed and then, but there will be the trigger so that you're not heating the old or trying to cool all of the outdoors. Um, but in general, uh, it'll be the smaller lights. And there are also limitations on the amount that the window can open for safety. Uh, you don't really want it to open more than six inches, even though six inches around the perimeter of the window can give you a lot of area for ventilation for safety reasons. You don't want the window to be wide open in an elementary school. You, it can't be wide open in an elementary school. 
And then there'll be screens as well associated with those windows because we don't want bugs and bees showing up inside or, or kids throwing things outside out of the window. So it works both ways. So there are um, a series of, of these diagrams to look at as we get into it. Um, and, and we're not um, proposing any really at this is, we're just trying to illuminate the process of what we're going through. Um, all of the materials that you see, I mean, this is sort of a, imagined as a, a neutral brick and a, a porcelain tile, but all of these are variable in terms of color, modular dimension, um, the window systems themselves can be different colors, uh, be it a, a flat color, a metallic color, or even a bright color similar to the accent panels that were shown on the similar on the previous slide. This is more of a traditional uh, masonry expression with an accent above um, with the continued pattern of fenestration at the classrooms. Tim, can you just can you just point out are two windows, a big and a small one classroom, or all four one classroom? Just in as this, people say. sure in this diagram, four windows are a classroom, so it's classroom, classroom. Um, and then there are other options that we look at where that distinction gets a little blurred. These windows are a few feet away from the wall that divide the classrooms. Um, this is sort of, uh, I would say it's a little uh, neutral, dark, Jim, but it's, it's in a, an example of what in 3D that sort of window expression would look like. But, you know, if that level of color and expression, playfulness, is not to your liking there's certainly more that can be added uh, the metal panel could be accent it could also be a different color masonry or part of the weight but there are literally endless options in terms of how we could introduce color the facade and which material and which system if whatever. this is another uh view of the north elevation. Each group of three windows is a classroom. Uh, occasionally, there is something breaking up the larger expression in, in places with uh, subtle reveals and changes in colors and masonry. Um, but overall, these window studies are based on maximizing daylight into the classrooms. Uh, keeping them within um, a range of fenestration that will allow us to meet the overall building goal of 24% um, exterior window in the window to wall ratio. Uh, that is not to say that it would be 24% in the classroom. It will probably be a little bit higher than that in the classroom and maybe a little less in under spaces or we'll modulate it as we continue to progress with the design. But, um, you know, this is the start of the studies that we will be doing for the exterior elevations, the materials, the pallets, the composition um, that we'd like to really dig into with a working group and then bring sort, sort of more developed and refined options to the committee as a whole to um, discuss and think about. So that is the extent of the elevation studies that we have for today. Uh, there, if we had any comments on that, uh, we could do that. And then I was also going to recap the um, daylighting slides that were presented to the uh, net zero subcommittee on how, um, you know, why what we're talking about in terms of fenestration is important and how with Gordon Thomas any we will analyze and, and quantitatively evaluate uh, what we were doing in terms of window. PB has her hand up. So I am just wondering, um, when does the uh, discussion happen where we combine things like 
window options, cost, um, color, cost, materials, cost, you know, all of those things that uh, will significantly, that could potentially significantly impact the cost itself. I'm wondering, you know, as, as we're looking at this, I'm wondering, you know, is there a difference between if we like the, you know, bank of four windows as opposed to the bank of three windows, things like that. And I just don't know when that happens. This will be an ongoing discussion, and as we discuss each option, we can talk about the cost implications, uh, but there are general principles that um, can drive, you know, the glass is more expensive than the wall, so the more of it there is, the more there is. Um, but uh, the answer is, every time we discuss, we can have the cost of it as context and background and consideration of everything that we do. Jonathan? Yeah, Phoebe, um, just to chime in here, another kind of principle here in general is for, uh, that for a given area of glazing, uh, fewer openings are gonna be less expensive than more openings. So, you know, for instance, Tim showed an iteration where there were you know, four openings per classroom, and this one has three. So as he says, there's several overlapping factors, but I don't know, Tim, are there any other governing principles that we might fold in to discuss? Um, I, 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 make, I, I think I may have made it sound like there's a, a list and a charter that uh, guides all this, but um, if there are there, that some materials cost more than others. So the, mm -hmm. the masonry is the baseline and then an upgrade is the metal panel accents, the porcelain tile, rain screen, and then uh, the most expensive of the systems that we're looking at is windows and curtain wall. So, um, you know, as you evaluate all of these, you should be having that as background in your mind. Um, there are some ways to achieve texture and color that, um, do not have large cost premiums like uh, varying the masonry, uh, things like that. So, um, as you said, you, you know the complexity in terms of the number of openings certainly, and then also, um, you know, as we present options, we will talk about the things that uh, add to the complication. Uh, Jonathan, I have a feeling you're going to be able to uh, add to this conversation. I, I guess the, what I wanted to add is that. Um, you know, you, you as the design team are, are working within the, um, the context of the, the cost estimates you have to date, and you know that those were based on a certain level of glazing and a certain assumption about the, the percentage of one exterior material or, or another exterior material, um, and that, you know, so that you've already, you've already kind of, um, I don't want to say limited the choices, but you've, you've made some assumptions about where you think this is going to be um and as as this develops further um you know obviously if there's deviations from that you're, you'll you'll highlight those to us um but i think it is it fair to say that um you'll generally be presenting uh options that are are within the boundaries of, that have been established by the the estimates to date absolutely i mean we on every job we have to design to a budget so we are, are not going to um, present something that we feel or know is uh, unrealistic in terms of what the established costs and allowances are for this project. Paul? Yeah, I just wanted to build on that. I, I, you know, as we, we already know that we're, we should be value engineering right now because we, I don't want to get into a situation where we put something fantastic on and then we get, you know, we know we're going to be looking at this and we're doing this at other buildings, obviously. And we're going to say, oh, we really wanted this, this texture, this, you know, sheathing on the building is so cool, but we are, no, we're going to have to value engineer it out um, because this is a very price sensitive project. So I just hope that when you present options to us, they're within the, the, the price range of what we've already talked about and don't, you know, I'm not like, I, we, I, I don't want to be in a situation where we're going to see beautiful things and then not be able to afford them. So I think we should be, you, your job is to help us be in that range. Like, like Jonathan said. Yeah. We understand that as our job and, and, and just as much as you, we don't want to be in the position where we present something that is not possible. We we will, we simply will not do that. Uh, Rupert. 
Hi, just out of curiosity, in the menacing study, uh, there's a couple of spots where you have glazing uh, all the way to the corner, going all the way to the roof. And I'm wondering if that also has a cost premium to have that look. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to formulate the answer in, in a way that is uh, befitting the sophistication of the question, but um, it's a very early massing study um, that is diagrammatic. Um, you know, we we will not um, present or propose extremely complicated details. Um, you know, all the time when curtain wall comes to a corner, there may be spandrel that hides something going on behind it. Um, but it it is possible to bring curtain wall at a corner to a roof line, but uh, we will do it in a way and detail in a way that is responsible both from a cost uh, and uh, weather type perspective. Thanks, Tim. Can I, um, Tim, can I just make one comment before we transition? I mean, I think, sure. I think what needs to be said about what you're proposing sort of in a very big picture is you're thinking of what this design proposal, the massing proposal mm -hmm. is, is really proposing that there be a significant differentiation between the, the form and shape of the lower parts of the building and the upper. And, and that is a direct response to the size of the building and the desire for it not to seem like an overwhelming size. I mean, that, that I think is, is a really good design strategy, but I just wanna sort of summarize that and make that statement because that's what's, that's what's at the heart of what is being proposed here. I, I, I think that is a concise and accurate statement, and I think we've heard that there are some concerns about the size of the building. We've mm -hmm. heard that there wants to be um, an identity, an entrance to the site and to the building, and manipulating the massing at the uh, west end of it gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, we don't think we have it resolved, but uh, I yeah. believe you have articulated you know, what the goal is. To, that's to, that's to... the design objective. Mm -hmm. Um, Tim, I'm, I'm wondering whether I could interrupt the flow as you're about to go into some of the daylighting slides, because uh, Jonathan said he has to leave early. Mm -hmm. um, and we had, I, I want to have that presentation, but we had that presentation on net zero. But as we're talking about the exterior of the building and the look, the, the there's the idea of setting up a subcommittee. So I, and the subcommittee would, if, if that's okay with you, just have Absolutely. that, move that Absolutely. discussion to here. Okay. Please. So the idea would be um, a limited number of members of the committee would be on a subcommittee that would be focused on the exterior, some color palettes, like what, not necessarily where a mural might go, but we could identify that would be a good place for it. And uh, Nanisco could be interactive with us on what it would look like if this versus that, and it would meet on the Fridays that the committee is not meeting. So it would be on the alternate Fridays and it wouldn't, it would be maybe an hour and a half. So uh, there are two things. Danisco thought this would help get um, more variations and then bring back a few ideas from, we heard a lot at the first presentation on the color of the bricks and the feeling of the school. It's an elementary school or it's an innovative school. So if, if people like that idea, I was going to look for volunteers um, for serving on, on that. And again, it's a time commitment because we would still be meeting as the regular committee, but it would, it probably would meet, you know, you know, when I talked with them maybe two or three times, you know, so they could just be reacting and then react and then it would be coming back. So it wouldn't be an ongoing. So it's a, it's a working group. So if people like that idea. I'd like to see how many people would be interested in serving on it. Phoebe's hand is up. People are going to just put their hand up. I'm going to put my hand up too. 
So is there anyone else? Um, and and this this meeting would be a public meeting. It would be on Zoom, and we would take record it. So it's not that you know if you don't do this, you you wouldn't have any idea what we're talking about. So are there any objections to setting that up? We have four people. Um, any comments on it? Um, I do. Yeah, Tammy. I mean, it's something I would like. I'm just worried about time. Um, so I don't know if it's a, like if I can prep in when I can or. No, I, I think absolutely. You know, we've had, um, you know, I'll, I'll use net zero. Sean is not officially on the net zero committee, but he's joined when he can, especially when we were talking about things that had to do with money. Um, so, you know, this would not be closed. It wouldn't be close to the public either. You know, so the idea is not everyone has to volunteer. Paul? Um, I think it's a great idea. I think, you know, as long as, you know, we have to be cognizant of having a committee of this, a quorum of this committee. But, you know, certainly if you have a four member committee, which is, looks like we have four people who want to join, not me. Um, and I think um, if that's, or you could you could even have a fifth if you wanted, just there's someone who didn't, who had second thoughts. So I think we should actually take a motion to create this committee and I'll move that we create a subcommittee uh, of up to five people to be appointed by the chair of the committee um, to meet regularly with the design team to talk about design. I'll second it. <laughs> and, and Margaret will capture th that motion in writing. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll take a vote and, and just be aware that we do have four volunteers. So mm -hmm. extent people volunteered. The chair will be appointing those four mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone else is welcome. So I'm just going to do a roll call vote going across. Um, Paul? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Mike? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Ben? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Sean? Yes. Simone? Yes. And Kathy is a yes. It's unanimous with two absent, if I'm counting right. Okay, thank you all. Um, and I, you know, the, the idea would be we'd either start it. 8.30 or 9, you know, in terms of an hour and a half. So I'll just poll the four people if there's any preference on those start times. And we'll go ahead and set that up. Thank you. We can go back to your, uh, Phoebe's hand is up. Sorry, I was also wondering if before we lose people, we wanted to talk about um, the time, meeting time. Okay. Or if we uh, did want to save that. So 9.40. Yes, I think that's fine. I mean, you know, we, we can't afford to lose too many people or we'll lose a quorum, but we have a request. This is under the, you know, the, I'm not good at the public meeting law rules, but we have a 48 hour rule of a late breaking issue. And one of our members, Alicia Walker, Jonathan, do you have a comment? Is that? Yes. I, I... I, I know I'm jumping the gun uh, uh, before you fully formulated what we're about to discuss, but I, I can be flexible. I'll just put that out there that I can be flexible on meeting time. Um, and with that, I, I have to start to prep to leave. So um, okay. I, will, I will leave it to others to discuss and with the knowledge that personally I can be flexible. Okay, so one of our members, Alicia Walker, has uh, taken a job that makes it impossible to meet at our current meeting time. And she's offered two alternatives that would work for her. If we wanted to keep it on Friday, it would be a meeting. Um, let me just make sure I sent the letter around this morning that I got. It would be 1.30 or later on Friday would work for her. And then if it's another afternoon, um, it would have to be, uh, let me just double check before I misstate it. Margaret, I sent it around this morning. Maybe you have it. Okay, I'm just gonna open it. It has to be later because she's, she's teaching. 
is the issue. Okay, so if it was other time, it would have to be. So I'm just looking, I think it's 3.30 or later, but let me just see. Oh, four o'clock or later. So if it's if it's another afternoon, it needs to be four o'clock or later. And I quickly um, spoke with some others. There's a conflict on Tuesdays with another council meeting. There's a conflict on Wednesdays with a regular school committee. So it would be Thursday, four o'clock or later. So an afternoon meeting, um, four to six or Friday. Uh, it could start as early as 1.30. Um, so I don't know the most efficient way of doing this. We posted initially, and I posted the charge to remind people that we initially took a morning meeting as the target in the charge because the experience in the earlier project was that we often lost um, the principals and the school people because of what was happening after school and evenings were not tenable so that we got intermittent participation rather than full participation. So that was one of the concerns and why we had asked people to make sure a morning slot worked for people. So um, any suggestions on how to do this? So it's a question of, um, I could ask, for how many people would it be impossible to shift the meeting to either 1.30 Friday afternoon or four o'clock Thursday afternoon? Um, would be one way or any other comments that people want to make about this because we we will she will not be able to participate any morning so it's not a question of another morning um, um sean so my preference would be for thursday but um we at paul and i would at times potentially have a conflict with the the Jones Library Building Committee, which has been meeting on Thursdays the last couple of weeks. So um, there might be a couple of meetings we would have to pick between one or the other. Does that mean at the same time slot? Typically meets at 4.30, 4 or 4.30. Okay. Phoebe? Um, so I was just going to say that I can go ahead and be flexible. I also, I, I just want to kind of say, um, sort of on a more general level, I think that... Um, Alicia is is one of those people that has children that are going to be impacted by this project. Um, and I think that if we can continue to foster um, people being on this committee who have children that are going to be affected, I think that it is hugely important for the perspective. Um, and so whether or not it's it's her or someone else, I think that we just need to need to try to keep that in mind because I think that that's a really big, I think it's a huge asset to us, um, and I it it's a it's a resource that um, we don't have a ton of on this committee. Um, so I just wanted to to point that out and um, sort of raise that while we're talking about and thinking about this. Mike. Yep. So uh, in terms of my schedule, again, not speaking um, about anyone else's. Um, Thursday afternoons, my attendance will be inconsistent. Um, so I have new teacher orientation that I run and that often meets on Thursdays. Um, I can try to configure those to not match, but there's lots of competing demands. Um, so I just can't claim that I'll be consistent. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just, you know, I'll be inconsistent. I think Fridays at 1.30 actually is pretty reasonable for me. I'm a little concerned about building principals, Tammy and Allison, and dismissal. So it means that you'll probably have them for... 40 or 45 minutes um, and safety comes first and they're gonna be out of buses because that's what they do every day at that time. So, you know, I, I'm not being helpful here, um, I suppose, but um, I just wanted to note that that's gonna be, uh, I presume a conflict for Tammy and, and Allison's not here, but I know I see her dismissal. She's outside every day at dismissal. Um, but on Thursday, it's just my attendance will be, you know, it's not that I can't be there anytime, it's just gonna be inconsistent. Tammy, you know, when I said 1.30, it could be as early as 1.30. So it was, you know, it could be 2.30, 4.30, you know, so assuming people don't want a Friday evening meeting. Um, but Tammy. So I, have, I have student meetings starting at 2.45, um, which hugely impacts my, 
the school and then as Mike mentioned um, dismissal so you would have you'd have me for about an hour on Friday and Thursday again would be um, would be inconsistent in terms of my attendance for Thursday. Angelica. So I also want to second what Phoebe said that it's really important to um, have people that have children that will be impacted on the committee. I also completely understand the challenges of that. So I wanted to suggest rather than deciding it right now, which is like knowing all our schedules and the complexity, it's hard for me <laughs> to even think through that. So maybe a doodle poll that we can try to do internally is just one suggestion where we can block off some times ahead of time that are already for certain committees. Um, and we've already heard from administrators certain times that might not work like during pickups and you know after school. And then given that, see what might work for um, Alicia and then work from there. So a simple doodle poll is my suggestion. Okay. I, I think I think that's a good approach. And I'll I'll try to put multiple times in the slots that that uh, the person who's asking for the change could work. So we don't have to say it's 1.30 or it's this. Um, Mike? One other process suggestion, because I really like where Angelica was going with that, is it, it could be that it alternates, right? So it could be that one week it's a certain time, another week it's it's a different time, um, or the next meeting. It's going to require people who, like myself, who won't be at some meetings to do some homework and watch meetings they don't attend. Um, I'm certainly willing to do it. Um, but I, I think it's just another way because uh, I'm sensitive to the points that Angelica and Phoebe made, um, you know, as long as people are okay that me and Tammy and, and Allison may not be at some meetings, we'll do our homework, I guarantee that. Um, I don't know from a committee level, you know, how people feel if, if we're not there, um, that's not my decision to make. Um, but it, perhaps if we alternate them, we could alternate topics, some that are sort of more focused on having people who work in the schools there and staff members and, and others that maybe are less so. Just another idea to try to you know be sensitive to the points that were raised um and, and again i'll do my best but you know just like tammy said there, there's going to be other things that are priorities that can't be shifted so okay i think i think that will end this discussion for now and i will work with staff since i'm not a doodle poll master uh, to figure out how to to doodle poll it and and then I know Sean, Sean, it, with a conflict with the other building committee, um, if it's meeting on an every other week schedule to try to look at that schedule. I'm also really um, con uh, aware of how much work we need to get done. Um, so we have to not lose meetings altogether. So thank you. So yeah, I, I, I can help you with the doodle call if that. Thanks, helpful. Margaret. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. We have done that agenda item and Jonathan gave a vote by proxy, but we can get a vote for, for real from him. Um, thank you. So I'm just, it's 10 minutes of 10, um, Tim. So um, I think you're back on the agenda. And then um, I'm just trying to check, do we have invoices? So we need to make sure we get to them if we do have invoices. I think we have one invoice from Denisco, which should be quick. Okay, so I wanna make sure we leave time for that and we leave time for public comments. So um, with that in mind, Tim, you're on. Um, I, I, I will do a, a brief version of a recap. Uh, um, daylighting, um, um, and forgive me if I don't speak to these quite as eloquently as Armak and uh, Alejandro did at the net zero meeting, but, um, you know, the big picture things, why does it matter? Um, obviously, um, it's to see and for comfort, but there is a litany of studies that uh, it improves lives in almost every measurable way of students and people who occupy these school buildings. Um, with more daylight, uh, your body is better too, and so you sleep better. Um, student um, test scores are um, demonstrably and quantitatively improved uh, if the quality of daylight in classrooms goes up. Uh, it also has benefits for uh, social, emotional 
well-being of his students um and and just overall yeah. academic performance is improved in, in every way if the quality of the light and space is better um so obviously we want light for daylighting um but uh, almost as equally important as getting light into the room is being able to see out that sense of connection to the exterior world has a very positive effect on the occupants of a school or any building. Um, but, you know, light has to be let in in a controlled way, uh, you know, glare or uh, uh, under performing heat uh, can make a, a, a space uncomfortable, which um, detracts from all of the positive benefits of the daylight. So, um, you know, there are multiple ways to think about daylighting in space and how it's measured. One is the level. Um, so more openings, more windows allows more light in, which allows greater illumination uh, and obviously the ability to see and do what you have to do in a school building. Um, you also want to be visually comfortable, um, meaning you don't want glare. So um, large variations in the brightness on surfaces um, can cause eye strain, headaches, um, and general discomfort within a room. And then, you know, as I mentioned, you want to be able to see to the outside. All of these things make for a more comfortable environment and uh, better outcomes for the students. And then another aspect of sunlight is um, you feel it. So if there are large windows with lots of light streaming in, um, it affects your comfort. You know, it, it sounds appealing on a winter day to have sunlight coming in and you feel that warmth, but there's flip side to that coin. If it's very hot outside, you can be uncomfortable um, in the summer and overheated. So all of these uh, factors have to be controlled through the design of the openings and the windows within the building. There are um, quantitative ways that we measure um, all of these factors, uh, daylight, uh, the level of light in the room, the amount of glare through both physically measuring it and through software modeling of spaces as we design and build them. Um, and then those measures are used by various um, accreditation um, like LEED and CHIPS. Um, there are numerous ways, um, some of them sort of arcane and technical, uh, but they all um, give a, a qualitative amount to allow the amount of light in a space, the amount of glare, and the percentage of views that you have in rooms. So this just um, goes over the metrics that are used by the um, various systems. Uh, as of now, we are using LEED, uh, which we have discussed. Um, it's called SDA 3350. It's the uh, spatial daylight autonomy. It's basically a measure of the level of light at a desktop surface throughout a room, and then the amount of glare in a room, which is measured by the amount of direct light on a certain percentage of the floor in a room. These are overall general good ways to um, determine light levels in room and they are used by leads and ships, but um, there are some things specific to schools that make them maybe not the perfect way to measure a daylight design for a classroom. Classrooms are rather deep. They tend to have class windows on one so side for all sorts of reasons. It makes getting full light deeper into the classroom difficult. Um, and then the metrics themselves were set up not for school specifically, but for building in general. So with all of the various types of building, office buildings, apartment buildings, uh, there is no one size fits all metric. So um, if we don't get the lead points or all of the lead points for daylighting, um, we can still achieve a quality, very high quality daylighting design. And, then, and this just highlights this metrics that the various rating systems do in fact meet. And here is just a, a reiteration of why, um, you know, the metrics that lead use are useful, um, but maybe not the end all and be all of evaluating the daylight design. 
And then working with Thornton Thomas Eddy, we will use software, we will use uh, building models to uh, measure the amount of light that gets into the room with the various elevation studies and as a rubric, if you will, to measure the design options that we put in front of you. And then we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to control the amount of light that lets in, the um, glare that happens. Um, one is the placement of and size of the openings, obviously. Another is interior and exterior shading, be it light shelves or uh, sunshades on the exterior, um, you know, but we have had discussions about um, their usefulness in this climate, but uh, they are always there in as an option. Um, we have to lay out the plan in a way that where light gets in, it is most useful and not producing glare on teaching surfaces or surfaces where you will be using the wall. And then we also have to choose all of the materials so that they uh, will appropriately reflect or bounce light within the spaces. And these are all things that we will consider as we um, move further into the design of the building. Um, and so that's the background that we will have as the discussion, as we present options for classroom window options, um, as we move windows up and down on a wall, as we move them to the side, to the center, um, just something that we will revisit and have as context as we evaluate future design options. And that's Kathy. Um, just a quick comment. Um, as people might remember, a meeting or two ago, we, ha we had an offer from another design company that had done a presentation on daylighting, and it focused on a school that's being built, Gardner School. And Tim got a copy of the architecture conference presentation that was done there where they go through a lot more technical than what Tim just did on how you measure each thing, but they also give some examples in this school that's going to be built. And uh, we couldn't figure out a way to schedule it without bumping some of the other things we need to do. But I was going to send everyone a link to that and also put it in our agenda so that any public that wants to do it. So there's a link to both the architecture group presentation and to a link to the Gardner project, um, which we can't go see because it's been, well, we can go see, it's just got steel and framing up. It's not a, it's not built yet. So I was gonna make that available. Um, and my understanding, Tim, is that we will get much more technical pre presentation once you do the modeling of what you're actually thinking of doing in our school. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. We will have Irma and Ale back, and and we will, um, you know, quantify, measure, uh, and 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 technically analyze, uh, you know, what we are proposing. Yeah. So I'll make sure Margaret has the links in the minutes of this meeting as a way because it's a big presentation. So it, and otherwise I'll just set it where you can click on it and look at whatever part of it you want. It's it's a big file. So I just wanted to add that as a note. I think, um, are there any other comments um, on this? Um, you know, when when we heard this, I'll just say one thing from the Net Zero subcommittee, the Tom, the Thompson Tomasetti team that was talking about this, um, there was a level of total excitement about getting light into the classroom. So I think that's what we're, light into the classroom and looking out light, you know, having that connectiveness to the out of doors. So as, and and that's clearly one of, if you go around our current schools, one of the places you wish, wish it had happened in 1970 or 1973, more. Um, so um, I think it's something that we're gonna be wanting to focus probably a lengthier session on Tim when you're ready. So that we're not doing it, we're not doing the try to add it later, but add it as we're thinking of what this looks like. So um, I guess we, if we have the invoices and there aren't any of the comments, let's do invoices and then open it up for public comment. Margaret, do you want me to share the invoice or if you have it? I actually have it up. Okay. So let me do that. Um, 
everybody see that? So this is Danisco's most recent invoice, which was just uh, just received. Um, it has let me just scroll up here. Make that go away. So this has um, on this cover page. You'll see that they're noting um, that the the request for this period is this number here, the fifty seven two one three twenty five. And then on the subsequent pages, um, they have the background of what uh, that's for. So some of it is for schematic design. And I believe some of it is for um, some reimbursable expenses. A little bit of solar, and I'll just scroll through the rest. This is solar designs invoice. And that is up. So do I hear a, a, I'll make a motion to approve the invoice as presented. Second. Seconded and I will go around the room. Uh, Paul. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Mike. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Ben. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Sean. Yes. Simone. Yes. Phoebe. Yes. And Kathy is a yes. It's unanimous with three absent. Okay. Are there any other comments, uh, requests about? agenda items, um, anything else. And people can, after the meeting, can certainly send me questions. Um, we've, as you know, we've received multiple public lengthy comments. And uh, as I'm getting those and they come to us, I'm forwarding them directly to the designers. So it's, it's, it's in the loop. Um, I don't see any hands, so I'm going to open it for public comment. Um, so I guess I, I can figure out how to, do, I'm going to, okay, Bruce, Bruce is here. Okay. Bruce, Bruce, you've joined us. Yes. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, add one comment to the, can you hear me? Yes. Good. To the, uh, conversation at the very beginning about, uh, pitch roofs versus flat roofs on buildings and. I can go with everything that was said, but I think it's worth also adding one further uh, uh, observation. And that is with large buildings or with any buildings with sloping roof, the snow is shed from the roof. And with large buildings with large roofs, the volume of snow that's, and ice, not just snow sometimes, that's shed can be uh, dangerous um, when you have uh, 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 exits and so forth around the building. So keeping the build the snow on the building in the way in which Tim has described that can be done safely actually has a public safety benefit as well. Um, I want to applaud uh, the design team on the uh, methodology that uh, is being used for the daylighting study. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging to me. And uh, Tim, I want to thank you for uh, sourcing the uh, um, the Jones, uh, the Margot Jones, uh, Dan Weissman, uh, Lisa Hersong uh, presentation, which uh, I was able to look through, and uh, I I commend it to others as well. Um, and I'm hoping that the uh, our our project here will achieve uh, approximately the same level of daylighting. Uh, performance that the elementary school, uh, the, the under construction in Gardner, which is the primary example in that uh, presentation is achieving. Um, last week, I, or last time or earlier, I was um, very enthusiastic that we should have uh, measurable objectives. And, uh, and Tim has explained the limitations, the, the, some somewhat limitations of the measure objectives that are generally uh, applied to buildings as a whole, as schools, 
And I'm thinking that the measurable objective that might be useful for us would be um, the Gardner School, which looks as though it's a, 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 a really excellent example of uh, achieving daylight in classrooms. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Bruce. Oops. Okay, so uh, Rudy, we have brought you in. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Rudy Perkins Amherst. Um, I really appreciate the massing study so we can get a 3D conception of this much better. Thank you so much for all the work Tanisco has done on this. Couple of quick thoughts. The media room and the music room have been moved to the end of the building, which we want to like emphasize for entrance. And I think those will be very interesting spaces because of their higher roofs and the activities in them and the collections and so forth. I'm wondering if more glass on the entrance end, the west end of those could be used to use those rooms as sort of a, a artistic or design feature. I realize there's a glare issue likely because of the western facing nature of those, but um, I think if we can design around that somehow, we should think about making them, uh, their visual appearance sort of appear to help advertise that into the building. Um, some things that are expensive could be used in very small quantities, I'm thinking, like printed phenolic uh, resin panels or photochromic glass. Like say we did want to emphasize the west windows into a couple of rooms like that. Maybe some very judicious use of photochromic glass. I have no idea on the cost. I'm sure it's expensive, but um, expensive things in small measure may be a solution sometimes. Um, I like very much the idea of opening the cafeteria to the outside, but I'm worried about school security issues. And I know restaurants have solved this sometimes by creating courtyards or fenced areas that are accessible only from interior doors. Um, you got a issue of how that feels to people. Uh, you don't want it to look like a prison. So, um, but maybe we need to look at that because I suspect those doors would not be monitored as well. And we don't want to undo all of our other security measures. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, Maria. Thank you. Um, the committee members will know that uh, I had sent a public comment about the community fields and I want to talk more about that. I really do think that it's important that there is a opportunity for public input uh, by the variety of individual users and groups who use these fields on a very regular basis. I gave you some thoughts that I had based on my use and my observations, but I don't know what size fields the soccer people need and what the ultimate players need and cross and the basketball users. Um, so the only way to get that information is to have a public meeting where that can happen. And perhaps that can be one of the first things that the design group does is to get that input sooner rather than later before you start making any final decisions. Um, I'm also a bit concerned about the kind of non-answer I heard, who is taking lead on the CPA funding. This will be, I, I would think this would be a real priority to get into this year's round of funding such that when this comes to the public, for a debt exclusion override in the spring, it demonstrated that, look, we're doing everything we can to decrease the burden on individual taxpayers. I think it's really important to get this done. We're already a third of the way through the month of September. Those things are due on September 30th. Now, individual, I mean, I can write a CPA proposal, but I, you know, I, I would suspect that um, the town uh, that is in charge of community use would have more authority there, more information uh, could put together a, a better application. Uh, and I think that needs to get to get done. And having this meeting of the community, of users, uh, 
of these fields is critical to happen right away so that that application goes forward with as much information as possible. You're going to get more support for this project the more that you let community members know that you're watching their pocketbooks and you're watching their resources and their opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I do not see any other public comments. Um, so I want to, I think I'm looking around, I'm looking around the room, I'm looking around the screen. Um, so, uh, and I don't see any other hands up. So Mike has made a suggestion on whether we might all want to meet as a group. And I don't know whether it's physically possible at Fort River to do a walk around, but we'll explore whether that would literally just be a, not a meeting meeting, but a, like a, a, a team walk through if Donesco can come. Um, so I will be back in touch with people about that and and a doodle poll, uh, a doodle poll on whether we can shift the meeting. Until we shift, you should keep the agenda shifting that we, the, the agenda that we already have. So we're meeting again in two weeks on, on a Friday morning, unless we shift it. So keep that in your calendar. Um, and I'm not seeing any others, so I think we can adjourn. And I want to thank Denisco because I know you've been very busy. Um, they've been out here more often than we would know because they're walking the bounds. And they're also, um, I, I just touched base yesterday briefly, but really engaging staff on how do you use your spaces now, what works about them well that you don't want to lose, and what can we fix? Um, so that interaction as will lead to the massing projects we're starting to see of you know where exactly are the rooms in relation to each other. So thank you very much. Um, and I also got to see Tammy in action. She leads leads little children around playing basketball on her lunch break, which was was great to see. So Thank you all very much, and I wish you a great weekend. We are adjourned. Goodbye.